Welcome to the Oral Apothecary Podcast, authentic chat about medicines, pharmacy and healthcare in the UK. Pharmacists Jamie, Gimmo and STC take on topical and controversial stories, but keep it edgy yet light-hearted. Podcasts share their desert island drugs, a career anthem and joyful patient stories. Welcome to the Oral Apothecary Podcast. My name is Jamie Hayes. Coming up in today's episode, we're joined by Professor James McCormack. James is a pharmacist and professor at the University of British Columbia in Canada. About eight years ago, he did this. Medications can kill the man Like a gun against his head Used too many, now he's dead Medications can also help So no, don't go and throw them all Welcome James in a moment as he shares his Desert Island Drug, his career anthem and recommends a book for the Oral Apothecary Library. Our micro discussion this episode will ask, is it relapse or withdrawal as we look at antidepressants and the role that social media is playing in helping patients understand their symptoms? Quick apology to our own patient and public audience. Look, we crept into the red zone on the jargon monoxide monitor with our last episode. We will try and keep an eye on things this week. Let me welcome my two fellow apothecaries. STC is in Bournemouth and Gimmo is in Cardiff. Welcome both. Evening. I'm just... Th- even though I'm thankful that even though we can see each other on Zoom, no one else can, because I've just had to watch you two air guitar and sing along, which which was you know it's like watching your watching your granddad at a wedding. But um, yeah, good couple of weeks for me. Busy. Uh, there was something on Twitter. I forget his handle now. Well, um, Welsh Gastock, I think, um, and, and he was describing the general mood in the NHS at the moment, and it is grumpy and tetchy, and I think that sums up quite a lot of people I've talked to and people I know. Is it's busy out there, isn't it? Everyone's really, really busy and and stretched, and a bit grumpy and a bit tetchy. So, so hopefully we can cheer them up <laughs> with a bit of with a bit of podcast. And um, read a great book this week. It's called To Sell Is Human by Daniel Pink. Have you, have you read it? Um, very good. And his basic premise is that if we work in health or education, we are salespeople. And so we need to learn from the techniques of selling. A lot of behavioural stuff in there, which is stuff we've talked on about before. We're all in sales, isn't it? That's what he says. Yes. We're all in sales. Yeah, yeah. read it. Love yeah. it. Not surprised Jamie's read it. Is there any book you haven't read? There's a few. There's a few. <laughs> Have you got a job? <laughs> Oh, don't go there. <laughs> oh, no, okay. Well, listen, I thought it was about time I recommended some more podcasts for the listener, particularly with today's guest. And so you've heard me talk about the Freakonomics radio stable, Stephen Dubner. Well, he's got a new one out called Freakonomics MD, and it's fascinating because there's a guy called Bapu Jenner, and not only is he a doctor, he's an economist. So he takes a really fascinating slant on things to do with healthcare, but from an economist's point of view. And so I couldn't help but mention these last two that came recently. One was looking at a load of data. This is fascinating. He compared what are your chances of dying if you were admitted to a hospital with a heart attack or a cardiac arrest on the few days that a lot of cardiologists in America are out of town and they're attending an annual conference for cardiologists. And they did. It was a proper study and they looked at the number of days and they looked for so many years afterwards and so many years before. And actually the mortality rate was lower when the cardiologists were out of town. And the second one was made me think about Chris Martin the other week talking about community pharmacists and how they could really do more clinically and this is a fascinating one because a pharmacist was working in a barber shop so they were worried about black men in LA and how they didn't interact with healthcare and they went and set up like a healthcare hypertension clinic and welfare clinic in the barber shop so the barber was introducing and getting people to come in and then they were all getting their blood pressure done and they had some great stats about how they managed to reduce their blood pressure and such like so it made me think about 
community pharmacists like barbershops. Communities, eh? So something similar like that was done up in Caerphilly where they put sort of well-being clinics in, in the working man's clubs and the pubs. Yeah, it's impressive. Very good. Uh, not much from me. I just wanted to point out for our keen listeners last episode, our guest, Dr Sally Lewis, was recording the session in her very glamorous shed, her garden shed, and with that came the sound of very soothing and calming running water from the stream next to her garden. So if you um, have listened to our previous episode, that might have been the uh, the mindfulness exercise that we um, added in as a bonus to that episode. It's been conference season for me so I've been chairing a few conferences and had the pleasure to introduce uh, Sally, our previous guest, but Dr Julian Treadwell, Alpana May and Mike Scott uh, at the Prescript um, annual event this week as well. So without further ado we talked about podcasts and how we'd learnt from podcasts ourselves so now's the real reality check that we decided we should invite on somebody who has done nearly 500 podcasts. Uh, he's from British Columbia in Canada. I certainly spent a lot of time listening to his podcasts and absolutely love them. I'm not going to say that we ripped off anything to do with them, but he does use humour as well as evidence. Uh, and he's himself and a family doctor, I think it's otherwise known as a GP in this country, called Mike. And as I say, it's Professor James McCormack. And it's an absolute pleasure to have you on, James. So just for the listener, you did your pharmacy degree in 1982 in British Columbia. Then you did a PharmD in South Carolina. And you've got a lot of experience, not just locally and nationally, but internationally, talking with health professionals and consumers about the rational use of medicines. And not only have you done nearly 500 podcasts to do with medicines and healthcare, but you've done nearly 500 seminars and all sorts of things. And you're big passion is around shared decision making and evidence-based medicine is it not yeah no exactly and thanks for the invite i really appreciate you guys uh, having me on it's somewhat weird being on the opposite side of the microphone if you will where you're you're, you're being invited to another podcast but no it's it's great and I, I am passionate about shared decision making but you can't do shared decision making without having a you know a solid understanding of the best available evidence so you know our podcast is really about taking the best available evidence making it easy to understand or at least simple to understand so so the healthcare providers can, can use it because there's no way you guys can look at every study and try and put it to, into context. So just as probably what you guys are trying to do, we, we try to become a source of information that is trustworthy. As you said, you got to have fun when you do a podcast. Absolutely. And just for the listener, so it's called Best Science Medicine Podcast and the strap line I love, and we can go the full hog here. So it's BS without the BS. So best science without the bullshit. We love that. And you know, some people take offense to the word bullshit, but I, I, I'm unaware of any other word in the English language that I can use that gets that point across so it's I think people get what we're, we're talking about and and the reason that that's so important is because there is a lot of BS and it's not necessarily and we'll talk about this maybe a little bit later on some of it is intentional but some of it is just people saying things that they truly believe to be true and so it's a very tricky process trying to weave your way throughout the bullshit so what would you say was the number one thing on your agenda right now you know the, the number one thing on my agenda really is about how do we take the best available evidence make it in a form that patients, clinicians can understand and have you, healthcare providers, if you will, use that information. Because there's no point in us doing podcasts or creating synopses of evidence if people can't use them and interact with them. And so I work a really, really good group here in Canada, some in BC, but actually all the way across Canada called the Peer Group. And it's all about, uh, for the last maybe 10, 12 years, is we've attempted to disseminate information in a way that's understandable, that's simple, that's short, uh, but right to the point. And we've also gotten into the whole writing guidelines, even though I'm dead set against most guidelines because they sort of tell you what to do. But we've written a number of guidelines because we felt that the national guidelines were not doing what they're supposed to do, which is provide healthcare providers with, with the best available evidence and help them uh, help patients make decisions. And Canada leads the way, does it not, in relation to de-prescribing? So again, for the listener, sorry if we're using jargon monoxide again, but reviewing and stopping people's medicines. Canada leads the way, doesn't it? Well, I, I, I don't know how you figure out if a person is the leader of it. We do a lot of it. And I think, you know, there's a there's a de-prescribing group here. Even the term de-prescribing, I'm trying to go away from because it, it sounds quite negative, right? I mean, I, I think you guys maybe even mentioned that on, on previous podcasts where there are lots of medications that are very helpful, but there are a lot that aren't. And there's a lot that are very helpful that are not, not used the right way. And so I worked with a group in the in the States about a year and a half ago called the Loan Institute. And we came up with sort of two phrases that they actually did some sort of consumer evaluation and asking people, what do they think of things like de-prescribing and polypharmacy? And consumers didn't understand those words at all. And so they came up with a really cool way to think about it. And one of it was medication overload. Are you on too many medications for you? Uh, you know, how do you put that in context? And then 
rather than de-prescribing, they came up with a really cool term again. It was called either medication or prescription checkup. Yeah, or MOT we have in England. Do you know what MOT for a car? Yeah, so I think that it just sort of shows how careful we do have to be with words. Because, you know, I, I, I'm sure you guys have enough experience where, you know, if you, you say, you know, we're going to try and de-prescribe, sometimes people say, oh, you just given up on me. Well, no, it's not that. It's the exact opposite uh, when we do that. But the term is not a great one. It's often viewed over here as, as rationing or, you know, you're just doing it to save money. Yeah. Because I think there's still a general perception is more is better isn't it let's not be too hasty james with uh, getting rid of the term because i bought deprescribing.co.uk about four <laughs> or five years ago and i still haven't done anything with it yet and i'm still looking for somebody that uh, i told uh, him not to buy it <laughs> <laughs> I'm by medicationoverload.com as we speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're right, James. Language is important, isn't it? And I introduced Julian Treadwell uh, this week uh, at a conference, and Julian was describing his work on literacy skills and risk skills of GPs in this case. And I noticed that you were down as one of the expert advisors on his paper and his research. I was going to say, I know Julian. I say I know him well. I've met him a, a few times, and I also, you know, we get to know people with groups that we work with. And no, he's brilliantly good. And, you know, he's such a, an advocate of all of the stuff that I know what you guys are doing and what we're trying to do. And it's really important that we have that voice in primary care to try to do that because you guys know as well as I do, you know, 95% of all medications are part of primary care. It's not the specialists. It's not in hospital. It's primary care. And so that that's where the problem lies. I mean, you know, an example, you know, when you see a person going into the hospital with a heart attack, they come out on, you know, seven drugs. They're all evidence-based, but they're also all prescribed at the same time and they're in a bed lying down. So they have no issues with low blood pressure or low everything. And so, you know, we need to make sure that we look at these things in, in a correct way. Oh, James, don't get me started on single organologists. I don't know if you've heard me talking about cardiologists and single well, You've already had a dig at cardiologists this, uh, tonight, so let's put that one to bed. So Julian's point was, and he was just reminding us that we overestimate the benefits and underestimate the harms and our decision-making. And so I see you on the overdiagnosis group which I think the three of us are on as well and very um, prolific on that but I'm on the other the anorax group as well I'm on the evidence-based one as well and that one goes deep sometimes doesn't it yeah it does and it goes deep for that group and that's brilliant but we have to be so careful that when I started all this, we thought one of the things we wanted to do was, why don't we train everybody to do evidence appraisal? And that's a complete disaster because no one has time to do it. What we do need to do is we need to say, here is how evidence appraisal is done, not get into all of the nuances of it, but then allow people who are busy everyday healthcare providers access to trustworthy synopses of evidence so that they can use it. Because you know the nuances that you can get into evidence-based healthcare, it's much of the time, I, I'm not I'm not saying it's not important, but a lot of it is just mental masturbation. And I don't know if we need to do all of that all the time, because what we do need is a reasonable ballpark estimate of the benefits and harms of medications. And that's what we try to create. And that's similar to what Dave Slawson said, wasn't it? In the episode last series was about you don't do the evidence appraisals yourself, trusted sources of information, develop people that you trust and use summaries that, that are from a source that you can rely on rather than even attempting to keep on top of all the information that comes out. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I, I met Dave, uh, I think once or twice, and he and his gang are doing a lot of what we're doing. What I think is really important to realize is that for healthcare providers, yeah, I'm sure it feels overwhelming, but I can tell you right now, if you're in primary care, you can find you know synopses of evidence that are useful for the vast majority of things that people do and i would suggest that if you as a healthcare provider are not at least somewhat familiar with the best available evidence around the top 10 or 20 things that you see on a day-to-day -day basis i actually don't know how you practice and it's not that you have to be able to quote it verse and passage and know everything to do with a Bonferroni procedure and statistical manipulations. No, you don't need that. You need to know, and we talk about this in our podcast and in, a, in, a, in all the courses that we do is, if I didn't treat, what's the risk? And if I do treat, what's the risk? And if you know those two things, ballpark, boy, can you ever have a great discussion with patients. And not only patients, at least you now understand it versus saying, oh, I treat blood pressure because I always have. I think you've got it in a nutshell there. And I say, can't speak highly enough of James's podcast with Mike. And so for listeners who are interested, look it out. Did you say mental masturbation? 
<laughs> I, I did, and I, I made sure that I added the word mental. Yes, that's okay. And did you notice that until Jamie just said that, we were all thinking the same thing. Shall we make light of this? <laughs> Before we move on, uh, uh, James, let me... Look, I introduced that, uh, the, the parodies that you um, are well known for. That 191,000 views on YouTube for the uh, Bohemian Polypharmacy one. Just tell us a bit of the background on those. Well, you know, yeah, again, uh, I'm a tenured professor and I can do whatever I want. I, I, I like music, and I'm always trying to find creative ways to disseminate information. And so way back when, I think I'd probably seen a few parodies. You know, I, 